I'm Ewan Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And yes, the iconic Amy Tan is here today. And I'm so excited because Amy has a new book that is quite a departure. It's called The Backyard Bird Chronicles. And Amy, since you're home on the West Coast, I'm going to ask you what today's bird report is from your backyard. <laughs> right now, there are about 10 golden crowned sparrows sitting on the top of the fence and also madly dashing around on the patio. They are getting ready to migrate. And so they're eating and washing, splashing in the baths. They will change into some of them, the breeding plumage that shows off their colors in a very flashy way. And they'll be gone by probably the middle of April, which will make our yard look feel very desolate until babies are born. <laughs> so you started birding in 2016? Yes, I started actually looking it with intent at birds in 2016. Because I have to say, I've known for a while this book was coming. And yes, of course, I've read all of the other books multiple times, in fact. And one of the things I really love about the Backyard Bird Chronicles is that you've done the illustrations, and it's also very much your voice talking about creativity and coming back to an art that you had pursued as a child and had a teacher who said, well, nah, she doesn't quite have the spark. <laughs> and now you've got all these pencil miles, as you call them. I really love that phrase. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering how you feel now, knowing that this sort of personal project is about to be in the hands of lots of folks who aren't you. It's in one respect daunting, because I am not an ornithologist. I'm not a bird expert. I'm not an artist in a trained way, except for the workshops I took for mm -hmm. birds with John Muir Laws. And so I was half expecting people would say, oh, she got it all wrong, or this is really silly, or the illustrations are horrible. And I've just gotten over it. I did it out of love. I, and it was for myself. It was not for anybody else at the time until my editor decided it should be published. And I do think I have to do things for myself. So it's always worth it, no matter what happens. And when you say your editor, too, we're talking about Dan, who was the editor for yes. novel Valley of Amazement, and also mm -hmm. the memoir Where the Past Begins, which I do want yeah. to come back to later in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And also this and having the same editor for three very different projects, though, has That's true. To be kind different. of fun <laughs> because you're using a different set of muscles in a way. I mean, you've talked mm -hmm. about writing fiction and sometimes it can be a little torturous. I'm paraphrasing you poorly, but, and then the memoir you kind of hadn't intended to write. It was supposed to be a craft essay collection and then it yeah. turned into a memoir. Yeah. And Dan yeah. was kind of behind that too. And yes. the birding book, I mean, your illustrations are really terrific. Pencil. Yes. Do I have that right? Yes. Colored pencil and regular, just graphite pencil. Do you think Dan is part of it? I mean, obviously, you're doing the bulk of the yes. work, but he seems no. to be a little bit of the thing behind it. He is absolutely the force behind the getting me out of my chair and my stuck place that says, this is terrible. You know, why did I ever think that I could write? And he's just so full of confidence in me that I don't have. And he pulled the novel out of the dregs, you know, of, you know, that we're going to be the trash heap and just really outlined what it was I was writing to show me that I actually had this story down. With the memoir he assigned, we assigned an arbitrary deadline for each chapter, which was a chapter a week, which is okay. impossible. You know, that that's something I never could have done. But by having that there, he knew that I needed that kind of momentum to just keep going and that all this stuff would come out naturally and had mm. to come out in that way as opposed to thinking about it too much. And this last book was something he didn't know that I was really writing, uh, you know, because it was just a journal. He, right. he would ask me about the novel I was supposed to be writing. And then I would send him drawings every now and then of things I thought were funny. And that's when he had the idea of making it public. I, I thought it was ridiculous. I said, you have no idea what this journal looks like. It's not the pretty pictures I've been sending you of bird portraits. I said, it's really these cartoony like illustrations of bird behavior. And he said, no, I, he said, send me 20 pages and let me see. And he 
took it around to a publishing house and they miraculously agreed that they wanted to publish it. So he has a lot of insight and foresight about what is worth writing for me and what's publishable. One of the things I really appreciate about the Backyard Bird Chronicles, too, is you're talking about how the journal itself and this book resulting from the journal is a record of your growth as an artist. And, you know, here you are as an incredibly well-established writer. You've also written a libretto for an opera. You've written the screenplay for Joy Luck. You've written children's books. I mean, there's been a lot of Amy Tan words in the world kind of thing. And yet the pencil sketches are really kind of great. And watching how you sort of change, I mean, at one point you're even like, well, the seasons don't really mean anything to me anymore. I really think in terms of migration and migratory <laughs> patterns. And I'm like, oh, this is really wild. <laughs> how, we, how we look at time, you know, right. how we look at so many different things. Yeah. I've been thinking about the work that I'm doing and where this book has taken me in an abrupt different direction. And So much of the things that I have done in my life are unintentional, that I did not have the intention to publish, didn't have the intention to make a movie or an opera or a children's book. And these things got sent my way, and I had to be nudged a lot in in people just saying, well, why don't you just look at it, tell us what you think, or give us an idea what you think that beginning would be. And pretty soon I've been lured and I've been trapped and I have to finish doing it. But ultimately, it's not just that I've been trapped. It's that I have found a way to see that this would be worthwhile to me creatively uh, because I'm always learning. Somebody could say, you know, if you do this scene for a screenplay, you'll learn how emotions are earned in this form. And I thought, wow, that's very interesting. Maybe I'll just try a page or two. And Mm -hmm. and then, you know, 100 page later, you have a movie. This one, I did not, this book, The Backyard Bird Chronicles, Mm -hmm. I did not have to be lured. I did it out of love. I just had to be lured into having it, letting it be published. It sounds like, what a stupid question. Of course, you want it published, but that's not true. When something is very private, it it would be like a diary. If you kept a very private diary and you put down all your insecurities and people you're mad at or feelings of betrayal, would you really want that to be out in the open? Maybe when you're dead, but maybe not when you're alive. And so the, the journal, the Nature Journal, had a quality to it that was personal. Uh, even though it did not get into that much into human relationships. I think, though, that, you know, knowing what I know of your work and having experienced your work the way I have, I feel like there is a lot more of you on the page in some ways. I mean, one of your mentors in the art piece was 13 when you met her. And you're just kind of like, well, she just asked a lot. Of, this kid was kind of really annoying. She just asked a yeah. lot of questions. It wouldn't stop. And I'm kind of like, well, I can't really imagine Amy saying that anywhere but this book. Yeah, I mean, like, nightmare. This girl is a nightmare. I have to get away from her. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have said that out loud at the time I <laughs> put it in my, yeah. But anecdotally, yeah. it is, it's another piece of this sort of Amy Tan universe, right? And mm-hmm. But also watching you work through, I mean, it's clear that you have gotten better the more pencil miles that you have put in, right? And I'm, I don't draw. I, I do not draw. I am a doodler. I will own the doodling, but drawing was just not quite my thing. But it's yeah. really great to see the progress and the progression and the change and the personality of the yeah. birds, Amy. Yeah. You don't see the very earliest of the drawings we spared you decided i decided to spare people that but i do have drawings where you see side by side what some of these birds look like early on and and that's very gratifying to me when i look at the progress that i've made the the skills that i've acquired a lot of times people will say oh you just have this natural talent and i said I will say to them, no, it's practice. It's learning. It's being diligent and learning the techniques and how this is done so that you have the right proportions. And 
I would say in the during much of the time when I was doing the journal, there were many times that I spent eight, nine, ten hours just watching these birds and taking note of what they were doing and then trying to draw and represent what I had just seen. So, no, I, I don't just sit down and write with words flowing out of my fingers or um, drawings coming out of my fingers with, you know, naturally. It's hard work. And, and it should be pointed out because I truly believe anybody who learned these techniques and they are available on the person's website I learned from, John Muir Law's uh, free videos. You can learn to draw and all you have to do is invest some degree of practice. The better you want to be, the more practice you have to do. So if you want to draw the way I have drawn from my starting place, you would have to invest thousands of hours, literally thousands. If you're willing to do that, great. You know, it's fun. It's why not? <laughs> yeah, but I love the the idea of investing in a thing that isn't necessarily for public consumption, right? It is solely yeah. for you. It became yeah. bigger than that, but it starts yeah. as a thing just for you. Mm-hmm. And you were 64 the first time you took formal drawing lessons. And I just, I love the idea that we can pick up things at any point, right? Like, a coming of age story isn't just for 16 year olds or 20 year olds. Like we can do things sort of consistently or, or change things up, I should say, as we move through life. And it's, yeah. that's part of the charm of this book Yeah, is yeah. watching you sort of say, oh, oh, I mean, there are moments and I don't want to spoil things, but you have a couple of stories where you're watching birds and you're connecting dots to your own fiction writing Mm-hmm. But also just to like life in general kind of thing. And I have to admit, I did not think about birds quite as deeply as I will now that I've read the Backyard Bird Chronicles, because you're wrestling with the sort of ideas of like, well, can I actually tell them apart? Do they have a language? How do I feed them? How am I connecting with them? Do birds have a sense of play? Mm-hmm. I love that question. Mm-hmm. Have you yeah. answered that yet? I mean, you don't necessarily answer it in the book, but I think you're still playing with that idea yourself. Pardon me. I do think that they're playing. And I've seen many, many more examples of that since writing those early entries. I've talked to other people about play and animals in general. And it's it seems there's there's enough evidence out there to say with some degree of certainty, yes, animals do engage in play. Whether or not they are laughing and say, wow, this is the greatest thing I've ever been on since that roller coaster in Santa Cruz and maybe not but I think it comes from that physical pleasure of doing something that is not necessary to do but stems out of our ability to do something often physically that normally we wouldn't simply do repetitively it seems to have no other purpose than simply to do this repetitively because it feels good And um, that, to me, is a sign that it is play. There are also three words that pop up pretty consistently through the book. Wonderment, curiosity, and spontaneity. And these are three things that are really so obviously dear to you, but not just in the construction of this particular book, but also just as the way you're approaching everything now. It's kind of like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I and there's a little bit of that too in the in the memoir where the past begins, the one that you started writing sort of emails back and forth with Dan, your editor, but mm-hmm. you wanted to preserve that spontaneity. But now I feel like you're at a totally different level with the sketches and the combination it, of words. It's it's really hard to maintain spontaneity mm-hmm. once you're published. And that was the feeling that I had when Joylet Club was published. I wrote that early on when I had no expectations that other people outside of my writer's group would see it. And once something is published, there's a veil of self-consciousness that gets lowered on you. And it, it always comes with this awareness that whatever you're doing will be seen by somebody. And you could you could destroy it, but I would be destroying everything. And that's exactly what happens. My self-consciousness has grown over the years. And I I now feel that I'm not doing it with the same spirit when I'm drawing as I was before, that it wasn't just for me. If I make a mistake, if it doesn't look great, I don't, back then it was like, 
that doesn't matter. Perfectionism is out the window now. I just get to do this for what it is, which is to make the observations. But all along and everything that I've done, what's been important is that spontaneity, which has to do with authenticity. It's not reworking, re-editing your emotions and what you've seen to be something that looks better. It, it's just what it is. It feels like it's an endangered part of my life. I will always have wonderment and curiosity and awe, you know, to be in awe of something. One thing I learned very early in life was that one of my goals is to live more deeply. And so with every experience that I have, I have to think, do, how do I take this deeper? How do I make more out of it so that this is not my simply biding my time on earth? Maybe I don't do it in the same way as when I'm grocery shopping, but I could, you know, I could make it something I do very deeply about how my relationship to food and people around me uh, in the same environment, looking for how they sustain themselves. Do you have a favorite sort of moment in your backyard when you're engaging with the birds? Because even if you're sitting there watching them, it's still engaging. You're still, there's an exchange that's happening for you at least. And I'm wondering yeah. if that's sort of dependent yeah. on time of day or. It's, it's almost always all day. They do leave at a certain part in the afternoon and then they come back or it's a different, they come at different times when there's going to be rain or after a storm. But generally speaking, it's any time. And I may be watching them, but they are always, always aware of me. And I know that because when I start to go by the window, they start lining up on the fence. And so the, it's almost like the call goes out. She's here with the food. She's here. And then I go and do something else. They don't come out with the food and they're just looking at me. They actually look at me like, what? Don't you get it? You know, but they're just staring. Every bird, if I'm looking at that bird, that bird invariably will look up at me. And it's not to say, hey, we're so glad to see you. It's, oh, yes, that's that that entity that is not going to kill us. We're OK. We don't have to take off. That's the message that I get from these birds. But that's enough to me that they are not afraid of me. I, I ask these questions, you know, do the birds trust me? What do we mean by trust? And you can only look at your your human analogy for what, what trust is, but it, I don't think it operates in the same way because for birds, trust involves not being killed, not being eaten. And our sense of trust doesn't normally go to that ultimate level of survival. And don't you say 75% of young birds don't make it to adulthood? Um, that's true with songbirds, with okay. raptors, uh, with, with, a lot of, with a lot of birds. They die, 40% of that 75% dies in the first three weeks when they pledged, you know, these very young birds because they don't know a lot and they're very vulnerable. I, I see them sitting out in the open for 20 minutes crying for their parents after the parents have left them. And that's a very dangerous position to be in because uh, another a hawk could take them, a sharp shin or a coopers could take them. And when I see that, I'll watch it and say, oh, how cute it's, uh, you know, I can draw this bird. But instead, I go outside and chase it away. I want it to know some degree of fear. I know that they don't know how to eat. For example, uh, you think it'd just be really obvious for a bird to take a a seed, a sunflower seed, and just pop it in its mouth. Great, you know. But no, they don't know how to swallow. They go around either looking at it, nudging mm -hmm. it, or put it in their mouth and then waving their head, thinking, how does it, they don't know to swallow it. So it's so many different things they need to know. And I'm just watching this. I would say that my favorite part of watching those moments that are, are the most favorite are watching the babies. The fledglings learn to fly, learn to feed, learn to land on something, and, and they make mistakes the whole time. And so, you know, they learn so quickly. You have a great line early in the book, too. And I'm just I'm just going to quote you directly here. 
The more I observe, the more I realize that every part of a bird and every behavior has a specific purpose, a reason, and individual meaning. Instinct does not account for everything that is fascinating. And part of why I keep coming back to that just sort of mentally when I think about Backyard Bird Chronicles is instinctually you've been able to create your novels, right? And and you've been sort of led through bits of your own background and the pieces you wanted to pull in and the empathy that you have for your characters. And But it seems like you're following sort of your own well, pardon me, your own homing system, right? Pardon the bird <laughs> metaphor. But it does it does seem like that. And yet here you are saying, well, I see it elsewhere. And yet, yeah. can we just yeah. parse that for a second? Because I just, I, yeah. yeah. Just that is a really interesting question. I had not really thought about it in terms of myself that I have these certain, I have these intuitions. I will call them intuitions. Birds have instincts like the homing instinct, they don't have a choice in their minds whether they're going to leave or stay in a yard with a bunch of good suet. But what they do, you know, that's interesting beyond those things we can predict is they adapt. And you find that to be especially true with what we consider to be smart birds, like Mm -hmm. the crows, uh, the ravens, the scrub jays, and they are persistent. And if so, for example, what I found very intriguing was the expert sites that said, you know, these are ground birds. These are ground feeders, sparrows. They don't go up to feeders. I had asked this question, you know, what should I get for food for the sparrows? And I got taken down on Facebook, some bird page. Birders, by and large, are really kind, wonderful people. They want everybody to love birds. But every now and then you get you get some you know, expert who mm. who likes to prove that they know everything. So this person said they don't eat food in the feeders. They only eat food on the ground. So, okay. Then I thought to myself, this rebel part of myself, well, what's to keep them from eating in a feeder? Is it because they can't fly up? It's because they can't perch onto something? What are the exact reasons? And I started playing with cages. I started making my own cages and having the birds walk into the cages from the ground. So they're still ground feeders, raising the cages up, raising the little feeder that's in there up higher and higher, and then eventually just hanging the feeders. And the birds adapted. All the ground feeders ended up eating in the cages. So that's what I meant by interesting, watching them figure it out, how to get into something. And watching their their persistence based on the degree of the tasteability of the food, so to speak. You know, if it was really high level, high reward energy food, that they would they would persist a lot a lot longer for that. But it also sounds like you're watching characters and their drama. <laughs> yeah. I think of I think of what's going on in the yard as these daily dramas. I mean, when you're thinking about bird life being life or death every day, it's a drama out there. And it reminds me of a time that I worked with developmentally disabled kids, mm-hmm. kids with disabilities, usually many of them born with a certain medical condition. And I did that job for about four years. And instead of looking at standardized tests. Everybody was into do the Peabody vocabulary test, do this, do that. I thought it was much more interesting to just be in a room with a child and set a bunch of toys down or this or that and just see what interested the child. And once they started engaging in that, for me to use language communication to see what they paid attention to. And that a lot of this had to do with attention, uh, attention span, motivation, cues, same thing that I'm looking for in birds. So that early job that I had, which I think is also based again on the qualities that make me a novelist, a short story writer, is this fascination with observation and dispensing with any kind of generalizations and rules and seeing how it actually works in real life for all the context that we often do not get when we're looking at words written by experts, the general patterns. 
It also seemed to me as I was reading Backyard Bird Chronicles that the birds are keeping you sort of tethered in the present in a way that your fiction hasn't always, and certainly not the memoir. And you've talked about the difference between sort of you and your, what you call your neediness to know versus a need to know. And, and one is sort of, you know, you can deal with a need to know and, and fill it with information, but a neediness to know is much more about sort of staying tethered to the past yeah. and, and yeah. processing all of that. And I just, I, I kept thinking, oh, wait a minute, Amy's sharing her meditations with us. <laughs> like this is you it, sort of doing your yeah. your morning exercise in a way. And I realize yeah. you're, you're writing these pieces all through the day and whatnot, but I really felt like you were letting us in as readers in an entirely new way. Well, I wasn't really letting you in as readers. I didn't know you existed. At the okay. Time. Fair, 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 fair. I was letting myself to observe and be the reader. I, I'm just joking in part there because I do think of myself ultimately as a reader. And when I go back, it, it, I keep a journal in, in part because this is part of me I may have forgotten about later on. The thoughts that I had, the thoughts are what make me who I am. If you were to look at me as an autobiography, it's the thoughts, the emotions, and the context that make me, not where I went to school or where I was born, all those factual things that people come up with. So it's a record of my thoughts. Uh, the Backyard Bird Chronicles is a record of that during a period that was difficult for me and where I needed to be rooted into the moment and not into the future. The future seemed very grim. And I had to realize there was beauty out there right in front of me. And I just had to be there. Mm -hmm. And that focused me, allowed me to meditate on what I, what I believed or never thought about before, mm -hmm. like the whole question of survival, not just for birds, but for, for anybody and, and what we do to survive in many different ways. So I, I thought about that. When I did the more detailed drawings, it would take anywhere from four hours to 12 hours. I would use that time to meditate on the life of the bird. Mm -hmm. and every quality and what what that bird had to do to stay alive, to become an adult, knowing that 75% of them did not live to adulthood. And then knowing also that every year there's attrition as well. So when you see a bird out there, you know, my realization is that it is in some ways a miracle that this bird has has come to this point, a bird that traveled from Alaska down to here thousands of miles to come to my backyard and <laughs> eat some suet and and then hopefully is alive and going back to Alaska to its summer home to to breed to start the new generation so i think about that i think about the marvelous qualities of what people do what birds do because they have to or because it's just expected or because there's opportunity I had to think a lot about what I believed about animals in general, you know, whether or not we categorically treat other animals with greater sympathy than we do um, for creatures we consider to be lower on the food chain, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, you, that you wouldn't have sympathy for a mealworm that is still alive and about to be eaten by a bird. So I had to examine my my um, feelings about that. I don't know whether you call them morals or ethics. It's just a consciousness about how we think about the natural world. Um, and it extends down to weeds and, you know, trees, flowers, everything, and how we compare them, how we look at life apart from our own life. The way that we see that, I think, in some respects, reflects on how we see our own lives and, and, and toward other people as well. So I came across this, some, some aspects of how people look at animals that really disturbed me. So one would be this expression, it's the circle of life. And that was, it, it was used often whenever you saw, read about a cat that killed a bird or a, a raptor that killed a bird, people would invariably use this expression, well, that's the circle of life. And I thought, well, there, there is something that has to do with 
you know, bigger animals eating smaller animals, et cetera. But circle of life to me was also to me used to shorthand how we feel about animals and ultimately within two seconds don't care what happened to them. Now, I'm not saying a hawk doesn't deserve food that it needs, but I still can consider it a sad moment that this other particular bird died so it could become food for this other bird. And and so I this is just my personal take on looking at life, not just birds, but but everything. But it does also make me think of something that one of your writing instructors taught you about drawing birds was capture the life. Don't just yeah. draw the thing that's sitting in front of you. Like you're actually yeah. trying to capture the essence yeah. of the thing, which yeah. as a person who doesn't draw, I can't, I don't even know where to start, but I appreciate the end result because as I'm flipping through the Backyard Bird Chronicles, there are moments where I understand birds in a different way. And I grew up sort of in, you know, a burb that was more rural than burb. So, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. there were coyotes and owls and skunks and possum, all, all of that yeah. kind of, and I mean, I would like to say that I paid more attention to the birds than I probably did. I had lots of wild turkeys. You kind of can't miss the wild turkeys when they've taken over the driveway. But to have that kind of access, I mean, here you are, you've been able to set up your own backyard in a way. It's not as if you have to go climb mountains to do this. You can yeah. actually just say, yeah. hey, listen, here's an opportunity. I am astonished now that I never really paid attention to birds. Like you, I'd see a big bird, a turkey. You know, I noticed turkey vultures or obvious birds, but I really didn't pay attention to what we birders call little brown jobs, um, <laughs> LBJs. And it, and when you start noticing these LBJs are not all the same, that they're all mm. different species, it becomes astonishing that you realize you had never noticed so much about these birds. I had in my yard probably three species that I ever noticed, a crow, a hummingbird, and what I call the blue jay that was actually a scrub jay. Maybe there were other little birds in there, but definitely I lured them by setting up bird feeders. But I'll I'll just tell you, not everybody has to do this crazy obsessive setup that I've done with my yard. One of the best ways to attract birds is to have a reliable, fresh source of water. So whether that's just one clay saucer that you use, you know, terracotta saucer or some other shallow bowl. And I say shallow because birds will drown in water that's too deep. Birds need to bathe and drink every single day, bathe every day. So they will be attracted to a a source of water. You don't have to worry about the rats with the food or anything like that. It's cheap. And and so they, too, can have a yard full of birds with just a bowl of water. Well, and I love the idea that you started knowing the three different kinds when and actually misnaming one of them. But I wouldn't have known yeah. that it was a scrub jay either. <laughs> I learned that from you. Well, I didn't I didn't know the name of the hummingbird. Right. They just called okay. it a hummingbird. Yeah. OK. But the idea that you sort of have this idea that there are three things. And now yeah. how many birds do you recognize as they roll through your yard? 66 now. Um, I just added one last week, a great blue heron, which is a totally unlikely bird to be seen in my yard, but it landed on the roof. And so I get to count that bird. Okay. Did it get turned around? I thought herons sort of lived by giant lakes, but clearly I don't. Um, They they live near any kind of water um, oftentimes, but they are seen on land, but typically a little bit closer to water. Now, where our house is, you can see the bay, you can see the harbor. It's still quite a distance. And I would have expected maybe the bird would be found a half block or a block away from the water and not halfway up the hill. But they're big birds. They can fly far. And it. they decided to come here. We do have the water sources, not big enough okay. for them. But the other interesting mm-hmm. thing that I have is a green root. So I think that the birds are seeing that this is a big green area and not just a hard roof. Oh, that's really terrific. Peacocks also, if I remember correctly, like roofs. Um, I was down in Texas not long ago and peacocks sort of like to hang out wherever they feel like hanging out. 
And as beautiful as they are, they're mean. <laughs> they're just not they're the kind scary. of bird. Yeah, you don't want to get up close. No, and they ha- they're obnoxious when they scream all day long and all night long. It's like having a rooster, but with a beautiful tail, you know, when they start screaming at all hours. I've had them when I've been in other countries that have them roaming around everywhere, peacocks. I had them suddenly, I'm, I'm getting undressed. There's a window. There's no, no building or anything. I'm getting undressed and suddenly I see a peeping top, you know, and I like this. And then I realize it's a bunch of, you know, uh, peacocks looking mm-hmm. through and peering at me. They're funny. Birds are funny. I mean, you get into watching birds, you see a lot of things that are hilarious. Certainly pigeons. Pigeons, New York pigeons are their own kind of breed. I mean, people have feelings yeah. about yeah. pigeons. I, you know, yeah. I'm okay with them. They live here. <laughs> we. I'm, I'm amazed that people hate pigeons so much. They're actually quite beautiful. They all have so many different patterns. And we make them pests because we give them junk food and they're going to all cluster around. But individually, if you were to look at them, they're quite beautiful in some ways, they can be quite intelligent. And in other ways, like the way they build the nests for their young, they seem to be a little stupid. You know, when you have two twigs as a nest, it, it falls off in the, in the first wind and your babies are gone. It doesn't seem too smart. There's that. But I'm also wondering if there's a film, not just in pigeons or peacocks, but I mean, we did get the American Masters documentary on you, which I'm just going to tell listeners, if you haven't seen it, go find it. It is terrific. I mean, is there something to be done to bring birding to more people? I mean, not everyone has access to a backyard or park space the way we do. Certainly Central Park in New York is its very own kind of special thing. Mm -hmm. But is there an opportunity, you know, to shoot quietly on digital and not disturb the birds? Is there a narrative there that we could do? I think that no matter where you live, you can you can see birds. Um, I can't think of a, an environment where there's absolutely no birds that you would ever see on at least some regular basis. It could be just a crow or a turkey vulture or pigeon, but they are basically everywhere once you start looking. And if they want to tie it into something that makes it enjoyable, I think it's great to find some way that they can appreciate that that goes along with their other interests whether it's writing down something taking pictures with their digital camera or sketching them or writing something meditative about them there are ways to tie you into this world many different ways did your backyard birds make your world bigger it certainly made it much more interesting to me during the shutdown with COVID. I never felt locked in. The yard does seem, I would say, not necessarily bigger, but each part of the yard was this very enriched habitat. So the part of the yard is flowering succulents and it's a open shrub area with smaller trees. And the area that I look at the most has tall trees around it, oak trees. And and that's a very different habitat. So I'm just very curious to go from these places, even though they're my say, same yard, that these parts of the yard are like going to different parks almost because different species are in these different parts of the yard. Um, you know, once, once you start looking at these birds, often I think many people find it addictive. I just read an article by Ed Young Oh um, yeah, about becoming a birder. Yep, I read the same piece. It's terrific. He's <laughs> I so know. great. It's it's so good, and it so mirrored many of the things that I felt when I first started looking at birds, and and the way you start, you know, with soon you're getting binoculars and mm-hmm. you're doing this and that, and you're saying I can tell the difference between lesser and and you know, uh, yellow legs and common goat and yellow legs. I I can't tell the difference. I'm an expert only, or not an expert. I recognize all the birds in my yard, but I'm not an expert birder still, despite having written this journal. It's only about backyard birds. I still think it's really fun, though. <laughs> I really, 
It makes it accessible. I think uh, part of it, you know, you see these giant guidebooks sometimes, and I know lots of folks during lockdown got or shut down, got very introverting. And, and I think that's great. I had a couple of other things going on and I love a good long walk, but sometimes I just need to be out and not looking at things. And I think that's always sort of what kept me a step back. I really know a lot of people who started birding and I was like, no, I just need to go for a walk and clear my head. Thank you very much. You know, I, I, I want to clarify, there's a mm-hmm. difference between birding and bird watching. Okay. And in the old days, I, I'm calling them now the old days, Okay. that birders would look down on bird watchers as people who knew very little about birds or various bird names, and they just sit there and throw popcorn on the ground, which is a terrible thing to give to birds. And then bird watchers looked at birders as these annoying people who would go around with their, uh, you know, fancy binoculars and long lens cameras and just, okay, there's the, you know, the black throated, there's the, you know, lacrimose. And they would just keep going and making these lists and just look like very annoying, like the kids in school who always raise their hand and said, I know, I know, I know, you know, very irritating Mm -hmm. people. So there's a little bit of truth in both, okay. but I, and I want to say both, ha- you just have to know what you want to do in your life, whether you want to walk and just focus on your walk and the, maybe the, the trees and the path, the dirt that you're looking at, or you might want to, as part of that environment, you're going by and you see a bird and you stop for a little bit and you watch the bird and then you continue. Then there's the activity which sole purpose is to look at birds and you're going from one place to the other, Mm -hmm. looking for as many species as you can find that day. I have to say the kind of bird activity that I prefer to do is bird watching. I am not by nature a birder. I don't want to be boom, 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 keeping a list. I don't keep a life list. If I did, I'd probably be in the thousands or at least a thousand because I've been to different countries and on on tours where we're looking at birds. Just in Ecuador alone, I saw 500 different birds. Birders, I find, frankly, sometimes very annoying when all they're doing is crowding out of space with their cameras and you hear this constant click, 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 you know, but they're wonderful people at the same time and I go birding with them and I take advantage of that and they all have this joy of sharing it with them and so it's a community that's something I think anybody can do if you go to Central Park try to find out a a place where you can join a group and go birding and it's a fun way to take a walk same way with all your local regions you can join um the local Audubon societies or those that have been renamed. I think Bird Alliance is how some refer to themselves. The clubs have changed their names. And, you know, get into doing this and find your own form of enjoyment with it. Which sounds like really perfect advice and a really good spot to end the show. But before we do that, I have one, one, one last question. Are you working on anything new? Is there possibly a new (laughs) novel coming? There is a new novel that I'm working on. I can't say when it's going to be done. It's, I think it's a, a serious novel about an issue that it was consuming me. It is the reason why I started the Backyard Bird Chronicles, actually. It was to get out of my head um, when racism became very much more apparent and, and to Asian Americans. It was so out there, so overt. I, I, it was almost like it was now... Um, People were given permission to be as insulting as they wanted to be, to exclude you. I started getting rude service and people acting as though that I was invisible. And one of the things that would cross my mind is not, did this person have a bad day, as I might have in past times, but does this person, is this person doing this because they're dehumanizing me (laughs) because they are racist? and. It was so disconcerting. Um, I started thinking it many different ways. So the birds was, it was, hey, what better antidote than to look mm-hmm. at biodiversity through birds? And the other was to somehow think about it more deeply and write about it. And so it, it's not, I don't think it's a bird, that, a book that 
overtly is all about racism, but at its core, at its the the spark of that book had had very much to do with with that. So it's two books that have have to do with what came out of a bad period. Well, and also you've always written about identity, so it feels like it fits right in the continuum. Yeah. Of, yeah. of Amy Tan. Yeah. Thank you for saying that too, because I think that most writers are writing about identity in some form and that oftentimes my books get looked at only in terms of mothers and daughters mm-hmm. and immigrant cultures. It's certainly there, but that's part of my identity. And that's why it is there. It wasn't that I chose a subject to write about based on those. And so in some ways, I I enjoy it when people ask me about these other aspects of writing that have nothing to do with those subjects that have been taken out. I do acknowledge that a book becomes a different book in the hands of each reader. And that's valid. You know, that's why we read. We want to find books that resonate with us. And so it's not incorrect. Um, if somebody said this is a book about mothers and daughters or about immigrants, that's not correct, incorrect at all. And I'm glad that people get something out of it. But I do love, I love it when people ask me questions that have to do with other parts of the writing, the language, you know, a- anything to do with the thorns of getting a book out. The thorns, the torment, it is a torment. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. When the novel comes out, can we do this again? And then we'll do that conversation. Oh. Because we had to have the bird conversation first, (laughs) Amy. We had to have the bird conversation. (laughs) We did. We did. And and they were inspired by the same thing. So so it is a tie-in. It's the next book. Yeah. Can't wait. Amy Tam, thank you so much. The Backyard Bird Chronicles is out now. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.